Alright, so in this video I'm going to be covering Matthew chapter 1. So first off, in a nutshell, here's what goes down in Matthew chapter 1. You have a genealogy listed of Jesus Christ, going all the way back to the prophet Abraham, listing 42 generations of people until you arrive at Abraham, which also includes the very famous King David. Mary is betrothed to Joseph, and they're expected to get married to each other. But before those wedding bells ring, Mary, who was a virgin, finds out that she has become pregnant with baby Jesus, who is going to be the Savior of the world, which she conceives by the power of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, upon finding this out, wants to end the betrothal and wants to put an end to the marriage ceremony before those wedding bells do ring. But Joseph has a vision from an angel in a dream and says, Hey, don't put Mary out like that. The baby that's in her is from God. He's going to be the savior of the world. And Joseph, being the keeper that he is, listens to the angel. He's a great guy and he ends up staying with Mary. So they get married and the baby is born and they call his name Jesus. All right, that's everything that happens in chapter 1 in a nutshell. Now let's break it down just a little bit more. So, Matthew is called the Gospel according to St. Matthew. I love the word gospel because it could be translated to mean good news. So basically this is Matthew's account of the life of Jesus Christ and teaching us how Jesus Christ is our Savior of the world and teaches us what he did to bless other people's lives through the miracles and power that he possesses. And in turn, we can learn and realize the power that can be infused in our lives and that miracles can happen for us as well. For even though he's not alive on this earth, he can. the good news is that his power, that because of his sacrifice, we can still feel peace and we can still feel comfort even in this life. So Matthew, he was a publican or a tax collector, and they were not very well respected among the Jewish people. If you actually go to Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, publicans were associated with sinners by the Pharisees because when Jesus went down to sit, it said he sat with the publicans and the sinners. They're associated together, and the Pharisees question why he did that. When Matthew was called in chapter 9, also, one thing that's really interesting to point out is that Matthew, he was doing his job. While he was acting as a tax collector, Jesus called him. And that theme is going to be noticed in this chapter a little bit more, and also throughout the, all the New Testament, that Jesus calls people, and they forsake their old life, and they start a new life, following after Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew's role as an apostle of Jesus Christ was a very special role. It wasn't that he was, it's not the same for everybody in every single case. That if you were to call, be called and you feel that you need to follow after Jesus Christ, that you got to forsake your job. Matthew's was to be a special witness of Jesus Christ to all the world, being called to be a, an apostle. But I think it's more so of we forsake all the things that are do not align with the teaching, teachings of Jesus Christ. So Matthew, I mean, his profession, being a public and a tax collector and cheating the people a lot of out of their money a lot, and ruining people financially, that was something that he could easily forsake to follow after Jesus Christ. So good for Matthew. So the first 17 verses of Matthew chapter 1, there are a lot to read through, admittedly. There are a ton of names that are listed, a lot of the names are hard to pronounce, and it's very, very likely that as you read that, you're going to rush through it as quick as you can. You might even give yourself a challenge to see if you can hold your breath and read it all and all straight through without having to take a single breath. But if you break it down, there's some really interesting things and the interesting people that are mentioned throughout those 17 verses. Again, like I said at the beginning, there are 42 generations of people that are listed, starting with the prophet Abraham. Now, the prophet Abraham is a very interesting person in the plan of our Heavenly Father, because Abraham, because of his righteousness, was given many promises. One of the promises that Abraham was given was that, as you look in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, that says that in Abraham's seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So Christ was actually part of the seed of Abraham. He's one of his descendants and actually the most important one, the most important figure in all of human history, in all eternity. And so that prophecy in Genesis literally rang true that in Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All those nations and all the peoples that have occupied those nations that have lived, that live now or yet will live, have been blessed by Jesus Christ. Also, we have King David in Jesus Christ's lineage. Now, King David... He was a royal figure. He was a king. And he he rose to that position of prominence from a lowly figure. Jesus, when he's born, he's kind of a lowly figure, born in a stable, not a very rich or famous family, but he as well will rise and become the greatest of all. King David, we know who eventually fell, and Jesus Christ, of course, did not fall, but they, his, their lives mirror each other in that way. It's interesting to note that if the kingship would have continued throughout that lineage that Jesus Christ literally would have been um a, could have perhaps been a king he was in the lineage of kings now some of the 
people that I want to mention is that there's four women that are mentioned among all these people. And it's interesting that there are four women mentioned. And they're not just mentioned by happenstance. Because there were many women in the lineage of Jesus Christ. But four are mentioned in particular. Their names are Tamar, Rahab, or Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Now, not all of these women have a very good reputation. Now, I want to say why I think that they were included in the record in the genealogy um, of Jesus Christ. Now, Tamar, she was the daughter-in-law to Judah, who was Israel's son. So he was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And she was done kind of wrong by Judah. And she actually had to use some means of trickery to better herself and to better her position in life. So she was kind of made, promises were made to her, but they were not kept. But she had to go out of her way to be able to make sure that she was okay and that her children were okay. Rahab, she was actually referred to as a harlot. Now, she was the one that when the Israelites were looking to invade Jericho, as they were going into the promised land, there was a couple spies that were sent into Jericho to kind of spy it out to see what was going on in there so they could make a plan of attack. And Rahab was the one, was the one woman who hid them and pretty much saved their lives. So, But she's referred to as a harlot, so not the most mightiest and awesome... Um, professions but she's also is praised in Hebrews chapter 11 as having great faith and so even though she's referred to as a harlot and that might have been her profession or something that she did she also what played a great and important role um, in God and preserving his people so we have Ruth who was the daughter-in-law of Naomi who made the difficult decision to forsake her family her homeland to convert to Judaism to become a follower of Jesus Christ and to become part of the house of Israel she, her faith led her to leave behind the comforts of her life. And for that reason, she, that made her a part of the lineage of the Messiah. And then we have Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah, who was pretty much the David wanted to be with and caused Uriah to be killed. Now, she's most notably known for that and famous for that. But I think what we learn from a lot of these women are a few things. And I could go into it in a lot more detail, but ultimately it comes down to this. That God works with those that are outside of the faith. So just because someone might not be necessarily a believer in Jesus Christ, or someone might not be the most faithful, most righteous person, God could still use those people. So that's important for us to realize and understand, because it's so easy to look at someone. Rahab was referred to as a harlot. You can look at someone in the profession that they have, or the works that they do, or the things that they say, and it's like, man, look at that person. They're so far off the mark. But... We're not looking at ourselves and realizing how far we are off the mark by making those judgments. It's not for us to judge. And God can still use those people. And not only use them, but he can also do great things with them. And he can also convert them and help them to become better people. And I think that's really cool that in Christ's lineage, there are people that are imperfect. And everyone isn't perfect, but there are people who are especially imperfect. And that they have many faults. But it goes to show you that Jesus Christ would come and he would make it possible for us to be redeemed from those faults. And if we were to follow him, that we can be saved and we can make our lives better. I think these women and their lives show us that God rewards those that forsake the world and follow him. We have Ruth, for example. Ruth, she, like I said, she forsook her homeland. All her customs, her traditions, her beliefs, her family. She made that sacrifice to be able to follow God. And she was rewarded because of that. Not only is she in the lineage of Jesus, but she's also part of his kingdom now. And to receive all the blessings of it. And sometimes it takes that great sacrifice in our lives. And we probably all, at one point or another, are going to be tested to have to sacrifice something. Some part of the world or some sort of belief that we really align ourselves with. But finding out that it doesn't align necessarily with the teachings of Jesus Christ. And having to forsake that. Now Jesus did not have a perfect lineage. But it was through him that all would be made right. And I think that's a big thing to see. That even though these people weren't perfect, that their lives were made better. And that they could and they became better. And that through Jesus Christ, they can become better. Having a personal righteous lineage does not mean that you're going to be a perfect person. Or having imperfect people in your lineage does, that, does not mean that you're going to be imperfect. You know, we can have like bad circumstances or we can have a bad lineage or ancestors who didn't make the best of decisions but that's not incumbent upon us to make those same decisions so it's up to us like to be able to make our own journey whether we're going to follow christ or not so god has worked through people that might not be the most expected god worked through a harlot he worked through a harlot to be able to save all his people now that wasn't the one person that you would not expect for god to use in his work but god works in mysterious ways god knows all it's not for us to judge or decide, 
But I think that Matthew lists her in the lineage, someone like Rahab, and it goes to show you that it's like this. Hmm, God chose a harlot to be able to save his people. Why not choose a babe that was born, born from a virgin mother? In the lowliest of circumstances, that was not to be expected. But giving proof and testimony of things that happened in the past, how God has worked with the least expected in the past, that he can do so in the future. And do so with his Savior Jesus Christ. And he can even do that with us in our lives. Verse 16, it talks about Jesus Christ um, being the Messiah. So the word Christ comes from, is a Greek word, and it means anointed one. It's the same word for, as Messiah, which comes from Hebrew, and it means the anointed one. So that means he is the one and only one called to redeem God's children. If Christ fails in his mission, there's no backup plan. He was the anointed one. There is no anointed two, anointed three, anointed four, and so on. Like if he fails, there's no backup. It's not like in a football game, if the quarterback gets hurt, you say, all right, send in the second string quarterback. No, Jesus Christ was it. He wasn't ever going to fail his mission because he has perfect love for us and perfect devotion and obedience to his heavenly father. But it is very important to point out that he is the anointed one. That's what those words Christ and Messiah means. He was chosen by our heavenly father to come to this earth, to be able to fulfill his plan and to be able to enact his sacrifice and his atonement, whereas we can be made perfect through him, wherein we could overcome our mistakes, our trials, and our tribulations. Verses 18 and 19, we get into the marriage between Joseph and Mary. Now, it was a prearranged marriage, so it's interesting to note, like, they weren't, like, lovers, like, to start with. It wasn't some star-crossed lovers hooking up together and wanting to be together forever. I mean, it was a prearranged marriage, and usually it was done through the fathers back then. There were two stages to being married in that day. First, you had the betrothal or the espousal, which was actually the most important part of it. It was even more important or considered more important than the marriage ceremony. It was more significant in the religious and legal light of that day. So it was basically a covenant when you became a spouse to someone. It was a covenant between two people who came together in a God-fearing way. Though being betrothed made the couple legally married, they were still to be chased during that time before the marriage ceremony. So they might have been considered, considered legally married, but they were still considered, like I said, they had to be chased. They had to avoid those sexual relations before the actual ceremony, marriage ceremony. So that's why Joseph had a very difficult decision because basically Mary got pregnant and he didn't know by the means which that had happened. I mean, he knew it wasn't him. So he basically had three choices to make because it appeared to be that Mary was not chased during her betrothal. And because of that, um, she had broken the marriage covenant, apparently, which she hadn't, but to the public it would seem so. So he had three choices. He could either publicly shame her and punish her, even up to death, or he could annul the marriage privately, which he actually chose to do and was going to go through with because he was a great guy. He didn't want to put her to public shame. He said, I'll just, we'll just do this thing privately. We'll just put you away privately. And, or he could go ahead with the marriage. Now, he decided, of course, to go ahead with the marriage. And that comes later on as he has the vision from the angel. He said this is that Jesus Christ was going to be the son of, that he was the son of God, that it was um, a divine manner in which he was to be conceived, and that he would be the savior of the world. So Joseph went along with it. So if you look in, I want to read Isaiah chapter 9, 6 and 7. So it's a prophecy by the prophet Isaiah. It said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So it's interesting this word is right here. I mean, the adjectives they use to describe Jesus Christ and the words that are associated with him and attributed to him are nothing short of greatness. And it says the government shall be upon his shoulder, like he would be the ruler over all. So if you look at verse 21, it shows that, the, that Jesus Christ is going to be the Savior in the fact that he's going to save us from his sins. And this is where the Jewish people fell short. They read the prophecies from Isaiah and other prophets such as Jeremiah that Jesus Christ would come and that he would overthrow the Roman government. And that he would set up the Jewish people to be the rulers instead of be ruled over. But that's not the case. It's important to note that Jesus Christ would save us from our sins. And note that in verse 21, it doesn't say that he's going to save us in our sins. 
It says save us from our sins. Which to me denotes that we have to do something on our part. We have to turn to him and accept him and follow after him. And to serve the way that he would have us to serve. Or to act as the way that he would have us to act. It's not simply just being able to confess that, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is the Savior. But it's actually after proving that. It's easy to draw near to the Lord with our lips. But if our actions and our hearts are far from him, then to me, it's null and void. We've got to be able to prove it with our actions. So Jesus Christ cannot save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins by us turning to him. A sinful man can, a woman cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We have to be delivered from our sins, and we do that by turning unto Jesus Christ. Now, like I said, the Jewish people fully expected this great Savior to come. Not a Savior of sins and of misdeeds, but a Savior, a temporal Savior that would set up their government like a soldier-like warrior figure who would be strong and powerful and overthrow the Romans. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is quoted as saying this concerning that subject. No single concept was more firmly lodged in the minds of the Jews in Jesus' day than the universal belief that their Messiah would be the son of David. They looked for a temporal deliverer who would, over, who would throw off the yoke of Roman bondage and make Israel free again. They sought a ruler who would restore that glory and worldwide influence and prestige with what, which was once enjoyed when the son of Jesse sat on Israel's throne. Overall, that's not what they got. What they got was a very humble servant, willing to sh share with all, his teachings, his actions, willing to serve everyone and to lift other people up instead of to bring them down. He was here to make our lives better. Not only in that day, but in our day. And that's still true, in effect, for everyone who wants to turn to him. He is the universal Savior. And I bear testimony of that. I know it. I witness to all that can hear the sound of my voice that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That if we turn to him, even though we're imperfect, even though we make mistakes, that he can heal us, that he can grant us strength because of the sacrifice that he enacted over 2,000 years ago. And with that strength and with that peace, we can have a very fruitful and happy and loving and enduring life. And one day, if we prove ourselves faithful, we can return and live with him again and with our families forever. And I say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Feel free to comment below if you have any questions. Feel free to comment if you have any comments about Matthew chapter 1, anything that I might have missed. I would love to hear what you have to say. And until the next video, God bless.